Hello, I'm Fantastic and Fantastic, and today we're going to be talking about the brand new Fujimi Fantasia collab that is coming to North America this coming Monday. So this comes as somewhat of a surprise because it was relatively uncertain whether or not we'd actually gain this collab, and for the most part, this is quite exciting because not only is it seven stones, so it's not quite as expensive, but it still has strong value. All the cards are diamond eggs, so it does give a certain degree of stats so to speak like weighted stats for at least the bottom rarity as well as tremendous value at the seven star and obviously eight star rarity unfortunately because there's only one eight star card it is going to be much harder to acquire any of these valuable seven star cards because they all must be ruled which can be problematic and for the most part i feel that this event is a bit more skewed towards top heaviness mostly because all the six star cards only have one evolution they lack that extra layer of option of having two distinct evolutions as well as no weapon assist by comparison the seven and eight star cards they all have the weapon assist they all have two different evolutions and it just gives them more flexibility you have more options and they can definitely fit in your teams more easily but with that being said this video will outline my thoughts and opinions on the various cards and how i feel they fit into the current pad landscape so the first card is the only 8 star in the event, which is the only card you can monster exchange for, and in their base and evolve form they actually share the same active skill. And this active gives for one turn a bonus combo count, then unlocks the board, and then creates a perfect 15-15 split of fire and dark orbs. That results in I basically either a perfect 10 combo board or like double VDP with 6 combos. The point is it's an efficient board changer because it also you know exactly what you're going to get which can be relevant and their leader skill does grant four times health and 256 times attack when matching two fire combos but the problem is two fire combos is not the same as a fire blob a fire blob means a vdp works two fire combos means you need nine and three and it's just much harder sometimes overall but with that being said lena in her base form is primarily used as a supreme dragon killing option she has four dragon killers, and four dragon killers is the equivalent to 81 times personal damage when facing this type of spawn. And that's truly outrageous. And I know we do have various killer cards that have multiple awakenings that are killers, but none actually own four of the same kind, which makes it much easier because you don't have to worry about lining up certain typings. Like, for instance, Praline from Dragonbound Dragon Caller has two god, two devil, and gets super awakening for the other, but you have to face a, a god and devil type spawn at the same time to truly tap into her raw damage. Whereas Lena Inverse just needs a dragon type, it's a lot cleaner and simpler in those regards. But with that being said, she's primarily only effective against dragons in this form here, and her other forms are also quite appetizing, and they may provide more value overall. So in her evolve form, she takes out that whole dragon killing niche and now becomes excellent at killing devils, while at the same time having other offensive awakenings, so they are effective across a wider range of spawns. So the same powerful active skill, and their leader skill is 1.5 times stats to all dark fire cards, and increased combos by 1 when matching fire and dark, and then blobbing fire up to 9 orbs gives you maximum 441 times attack. So it looks nice on paper, but the scaling is actually not that um, nice, so to speak, because with a single 6 match, there will only be 144 times attack. Yes, you can stack rows and whatnot, but 144 times attack, it's really not that great. And in all honesty, she's better off pairing with Rao, who is arguably the best fire leader in the game because he has the auto fall of attack damage. But at the same time, she doesn't contribute to his system, so she may not necessarily be the best option, but it is an option for players who don't actually own him. But with that being said, I want to take a look at these awakenings again. So double seven combo and VDP. That's a reasonably healthy amount of personal damage when forming that 3x3 box. Like, it's not negligible. It is there. It's quite high still. And, of course, if they are facing a Devil-type swab, which is arguably the most common one in the entire game, it provides them with 36 personal times damage without the VDP, and then 90 times personal damage when you form that VDP. So, Devil-type spawns, which, again, are incredibly common in 
things like Alterin 3 will get melted very quickly, and that is definitely a nice benefit overall. Furthermore, you can gain either tape resist or 100% jammer immunity, and it just gives some nice flexibility. So kind of returning to our leader skill aspect, if you pair of Rao, you gain that auto fall of attack damage, which is why he's so powerful, but when you link six fire orbs, you now have 210 times attack. That's actually quite reasonable overall, like it definitely is much better compared to 144 times, and you get the auto fall of attack damage. You will possibly have a bit less health depending on how much fire dark cards you have, but I feel like this is definitely a much advantageous trade to make overall. I wouldn't use double Lena Inverse because it just doesn't quite do enough, I feel, overall. Now, coming to her weapon assist, it provides you with a tape and a skill boost. So we're starting to see more and more skill boost weapon assists that have a secondary or collateral benefit attached with them. And this becomes more important because as we start trying to min-max our teams, we want to try and bring the more desirable awakenings that we need to have covered, and anything else we can gain at the same time is obviously beneficial. So depending on the dungeon that's needed, the tape resist may or may not be that important, and the active skill itself that's attached to it does a bit of several things for fire type teams which can be beneficial but one team that i want to kind of highlight a bit more closely because it's so new for us is fagan rye because they require 22 skill boosts in order to activate their transformational aspect which makes them a tremendously powerful leader and oftentimes you might have to rely on weapon assists for those skill boosts so you are going to still have to cover other metrics and maybe tape is a truly important one in the dungeon you're going to be playing through and because you're needing that skill boost anyways it's a wonderful collateral benefit to have at the same time so just keep that in mind when you're looking at any skill boost weapon assist and look at what other types of beneficial awakenings come with it now, let's transition into the seven stars, and the seven stars also have tremendous amounts of value. Like, all of them are good, and some are obviously better than others, but it is definitely a top-heavy event, unfortunately. But with that being said, this individual here is incredibly strong. Not in this form, it's really the other form that is much more important, because yes, you do have four TPAs, you do have reasonably high attack, you could get, you have VDP, but the problem is you have to make VDP and TPA, doesn't really go. The leader skill itself, like it is reasonably strong, but the amount of effective health is quite low. And if you are pairing with someone else, like a blob leader such as Tifu or Halmaru, his TPAs go to waste and they don't help really anyone else. It's just not quite the leader skill we want. And in all honesty, it's just you should really look at their evolve form because their evolve form is just something else. Like Gung Ho basically took basically all the powerful awakenings they can think of and stuck them all on one card. It's just kind of outrageous almost. So their active skill for one turn gives you a 25% chance for more light orbs to appear. So that is a sizable skyfall buff. And you also generate a column of light orbs as well. So it's an orb changer and a very high chance of having a skyfall. Not a bad for an eight turn active skill. It's kind of in the mid range for how fast and active skill charges up, but it's still reasonable. Their leader skill, they want attacker types, they want rainbow activation, they want seven combos. It's just a lot of things going on. It's not why they're so desirable, it's because of their sub potential. So as a sub, they have a devil killer, which we've established before that is a very powerful awakening to have. Double seven combo, but it's triple with super awakening, so nice, eight times personal damage there. And then boom, there's a VDP alongside of it. So you got triple seven combo, you have VDP, you have a devil killer. You're kind of like Ranger Slayer. Like Ranger Slayer does have a god killer set and does have a thousand more attack, but this is kind of the archetype I feel of kind of like the future for damage awakening cards in pad. They have the triple seven, they have the VDP, they have a relevant killer awakening and reasonably high attack as well. Like this guy has reasonable attack and like it's still gonna pump up massive amounts of damage. But to take this one step further, there is 100% poison immunity alongside of it. Ranger Slayer doesn't have this. No offensive card has this amount of utility and offensive prowess at the same time. This is kind of a new thing, and it's pretty amazing. And I'd say it's arguably one of the stronger light subs possible, and that's saying a lot because light is already quite a saturated color. So there are no real drawbacks to this card in my opinion, so to speak, like their weighted stats are reasonably high, especially considering it's only a seven stone event. And it's just more so you can't monster exchange for them. And to be honest, is that really that big of a deal? Probably not. Well, it is because you may not be able to roll him, but like as far as the card itself is concerned, it's really technically not a factor. 
And even though you have options like Bridezilla, Bradamante, Knight, Halloween Cotton, Yomi, and Dao Chan, I would probably use this individual, I'm not pronouncing the name so I'll say it wrong, over some of those cards, even if I were to roll him, because it just brings more to the table. I could rearrange my Awakenings, I can rearrange my Inherits, I won't need Poison Resist anymore. It's quite a powerful aspect to have. And their Weapon Assist would also have been game-breaking if it came out one year earlier, before Auto Follow-Up Attack was invented, because it is the only Weapon Assist that actually provides a follow-up attack. So this would have been truly amazing before, because sometimes it may have been awkward to squeeze in follow-up attack on your team, but usually it's not the case, but having that as an option is definitely valuable. And the active itself is actually has quite a few interesting aspects, mostly for farming purposes, but for one turn, you cancel out attribute absorb. So if it's light absorb, okay, it's gone. And then you deal three million damage to all dark enemies. And that's light damage, so it's doubled, now it's six million. A six million damage button that is not tied to the card's attack value. So something like Waildor, who has terrible stats but five skill boosts, could inherit this and deal six million damage with a button. It's very powerful, it's very interesting. And in my opinion, like it does have its uses, but I feel that their evolved form will be more relevant for the vast majority of players. Next is Orphan and... This individual here has several, more like two unique ultimate evolutions and a weapon assist. So they actually have four different forms, so they have more flexibility. But in their base form, which they share of one of their evolved forms, they can reduce your health by 50%, unlock all orbs, and then change all heal to dark, and then lock dark. That's quite a few things going on, and it's only a three turn cooldown, and that's quite reasonable. And the leader skill here is you do four and a half times attack, reduce damage by 25% when four or more combos, which is definitely doable, and then two times attack when matching four or more connected orbs up to four times of six. So it caps out at 324 times attack and 75% damage reduction. Those are quite high, but for some players who are trying to swipe farm things, you need to make combos, and it just won't be exactly what's gonna work out necessarily. You might be matching one combo for the sake of speed and time, so it may not necessarily be the best option in that regards, but again, if you're not interested in purely blitzing through a dungeon, this is a very high multiplier for a pretty low activation requirement in terms of like raw damage output, along with the fact that they have three attack while below 50% awakenings, and that translates into eight times personal damage. So. If there are no void spawns in the dungeon, this is incredibly strong, but if there are void spawns in the dungeon, then it does become a little less appetizing because all that damage does go to waste. So it's definitely for a more of a farming context or especially something like training arena where you want to go through something quickly and you can nuke your own health and generate more orbs at the same time. A very beneficial active skill to have. But with that being said, they have many other valuable forms and it's going to be somewhat of a tough decision for players for which one they actually want to make. So in their first evolved form, they share the same active skill, but their leader skill is much more flexible. It has much higher effective health and the same attack multiplier. So basically you gain one and a half times stats for dark cards and then bonus damage when six or more combos and then more damage when, when your health is below 50% and gain that massive 75% damage reduction shield. So these multipliers are solid. Those are big numbers, but it's not as amazing because you have to remember that damage reduction only takes place when you are below 50%. So you are essentially two and a half times health for most of your life, so to speak. And this is something to keep in the back of your mind because if you heal when you're below 50%, you just pass 50%, like say you're at 60%, you can take a hit and you might possibly die because your effective health is not like you don't have that damage reduction aspect alongside of it so it can be problematic so juggling health and healing is definitely an issue of course with a fast charging active skill such as this along with access to Zerog core it's much more readily available to keep your health exactly where you need to be and this is a tremendously powerful multiplier and it only needs six or more combos so oftentimes when you have to vdp and follow up attack you may not get that seventh combo but your multiplier at least still takes full effect which is beneficial overall. So you are combining many different aspects at the same time, 
attack while below 50% leaders have the advantage of requiring lower combo counts in general, and that does increase the speed in which they can clear content, along with basically lowering the puzzling skills required, so to speak, because you, you can make less combos and still deal tremendous amounts of damage. But of course, you want to have access to a health reset all the time, so it kind of does make it a bit more mandatory to have zero core because it's the best one turn health reset active in the game because it comes with a great card which has synergy on this team. But even barring that, double orphan with both their actives and maybe just proper management, so to speak, can keep you at the required threshold. But again, if this is not a playstyle you enjoy, some people just dislike the fact that they have to micromanage their health so attentively. It may be something that may not be less appealing, but fear not, they do have more forms to choose from. So Orphan's other evolved form is able to become a reasonably powerful 7x6 leader, and it does remind me somewhat of kind of Tifa in the sense that the multipliers are reasonable attack. It is definitely lower here, but high amounts of RCV and damage reduction instead of health. So it might be possibly something interesting, but their multipliers don't require blobs. They just requ simply require to match light and dark orbs. So it is a bit different compared to like matching rows and gaining the team's passive damage, which is important for Tifa teams. So I'm not sure with a multiplier like this, would it be possibly too low? There are no rows, so to speak. You may not necessarily be incorporating rows in your team. I don't know, as long as like what other passive damage you have to can really push your multipliers high enough. I could be wrong, it's hard to say. I don't have these cards and it's all theorized at this point, but you do have a significant amount of t health through these team health awakenings. You have strong personal damage from Orphan themselves, but they are lacking full bind immunity. And as your leader being by, like becoming bound is a lot more dangerous compared to a sub. So it is a bit of a drawback for sure. And again, do we really need to have a dark seven by six? Like, is it gonna improve on like the Ina pairings that are currently available? I'm not sure, but maybe we can see over time. Now with their weapon assist, their active skill provides 99 turns of dark skyfalls and changes all orbs to light, dark, and heal on a 15 turn cooldown. So this is quite powerful along with the fact that it is a bind immune weapon with time extend. So there are kind of two different aspects to this weapon assist, the awakenings and the active. So for bind immune weapons, generally speaking, you want to have long cooldowns associated with them so it doesn't accidentally charge up because you may not necessarily want the inherited skill. But at the same time, this inherited skill is one of the stronger aspects in the game because Hiei has become a very dominant and powerful dark sub just because he provides that 99 turn skyfall buff. And you may not always be able to utilize him on your team compositions such as like the wrong typing, but you want that skyfall buff. So you can utilize this weapon assist in lieu of a Hiei inherit and you still get some additional benefits. So it has that aspect there as well. Or you just simply don't Hiei, you own Hiei. You just want to actually have this dark skyfall buff and then it's obviously significantly more powerful overall. So it is quite a powerful weapon assist and Orphan does have so many valuable forms. All of his forms provide value in different ways and it's up to your individual monster box to determine what form is best for yourself. And the next is this everlasting girl and she reminds me most strongly of Diao Chan because they have reasonably similar kit structures because they both have a fast charging active skill that provides quite a few benefits. They have L, they have full bind immunity, no, so they have full immunity to either poison or blind in Diao Chan's case, as well as other benefits. In this case here, you gain cloud resist alongside of it. So she's bringing many different benefits alongside at this point in time. And I wanna look at her active skill more closely because it's very powerful for three turns. So basically for one turn, you have no zero times RCV. So if my translations are not incorrect, it means you should have no healing for one turn. But the benefit of that is you overwrite RCV debuffs. That is the main benefit overall. You get bonus orb movement time. You Sorry, you lose orb movement time. Again, this is just to overwrite debuffs. You don't really want to do that to yourself. But then at the same time, you'll also change the top row to light orbs. So you are basically kind of shooting yourself in the foot a little bit to have a very fast charging row orb changer. 
That is very powerful because on three turns, this can cycle up very quickly. You can use it early on and just continuously use it throughout the dungeon. Of course, these penalties can be problematic, but at the same time, these penalties are actually ways to overwrite existing debuffs from various spawns. Like for instance, say you get heavily time extended debuffed on a certain floor for many turns, or you get heavily RCB debuffed again for many turns. Using this active skill will completely overwrite those and yes, you suffer for one turn, but you're suffering much less and for a much shorter duration. And that is the main appeal of that as well. So it is quite a powerful active skill. Now, the main drawbacks is that, well, it's kind of like Diao Chan. You don't really have personal damage. You just have too many L's. But at this point in time, I'm more partial to using Diao Chan, mostly because I find that blind immunity is significantly more valuable compared to poison, at least for Tifa teams. And Tifa teams are kind of what is dominating right now the light meta, and they have tremendously high amounts of RCV, which kind of makes the RCV nerf to themselves not as helpful because RCV debuffs tend to be not as dangerous. Like you can build teams that don't have to override the debuff and you're perfectly fine. So you kind of lose a little bit of an edge there. Whereas Diao Chan also does time extend bonus, not minus, but she also provides an Awoken Bind Clear. And Awoken Bind Clear is actually quite valuable because at least in Alterina 3 with Hamal, there's a 50% chance you will need that Awoken Bind Clear or you're wasting an active skill somewhere else. So it is something that Diao Chan just edges out a bit higher. And I feel like that's what make, makes this card a little less amazing, along with the fact that again, Light has so many strong cards. And when you're overlapping so heavily with something else, it may not necessarily be what you need to bring to your team overall. Of course, with that being said, this is still a tremendously powerful card overall. And in her evolved form, basically she trades all that utility for just raw VDP damage. And raw VDP damage can be nice, but again, with light-based teams, you tend to have a very deep sub pool. And I've said before that triple seven combo VDP tends to be a very powerful aspect, which is quite common. And the reason for that is on every given board, you're not necessarily going to be matching three by three unless it's your specific team type. But if you do match the VDP, then you gain all this bonus damage. But the problem is you're not doing so often. So in her case here, you'll be dealing no personal damage on the vast majority of floors. Whereas something like Halloween Cotton will at least be dealing eight times personal damage on all those other floors, which does definitely edge her out, edge her behind in those cases. But with that being said, her leader skill actually has synergy with that because it's basically like a beach Varroa in the sense that you need to connect nine or more light orbs. Unfortunately, her multipliers are just not as good. It's 225 versus 324, and it is also plus two and not plus three combos. So it's just things are just holding her back. Beach Varroa also has much higher weighted stats. And for the most part, it's just a more solid team overall. And it's not to say this card cannot be used either, it's just that I feel it's not as amazing compared to the other counterpart options that can fulfill similar types of roles. In regards to her weapon assist, she provides an enhanced heart of awakening and an L unlock. And then for the active skill itself, it's two times damage for all light cards and then change the top and bottom row to light. So there's quite a few things going on. Firstly, as the Awakenings go, it's a way to generate additional healing and have the ability to unlock orbs when matching a 5 connect. So this is a great way to bolster your healing output overall, and it definitely helps on cards with naturally higher CV along with the Enhanced Heal Orb Awakening already to kind of just push them a bit further ahead. With that being said, if you are looking for on stat color transfers, Light tends to not need this as much, and at least in my opinion, I find that the Yellow Ranger's Weapon Assist to be a stronger option for an Enhanced Heal Orb Awakening card to transfer because it does give a Poison Resist and it does give, in my opinion, a stronger active skill compared to this option here because it's full bind and Awoken Binds and changing something to Light and something else to Hearts. <laughs> Next is Sagara and for this individual here, their main appeal is going to be their five or six attack while above 80% awakenings. It's the only card in the game to have this many. It does grant him 11.4 times personal damage, and it's definitely mostly for like farming and or ranking dungeons because 
that's where you're able to keep your health at the correct threshold or you need to make fewer combos to deal damage. And the point of the matter is, it is a niche to fill, but it is a very powerful niche that no one else does as well. So it does give him an advantage in those regards. With that being said, that's kind of its main application, but don't fear, they have other um, evolution forms which are very powerful. So in his first of all form, they still have the same active skill, which is a one turn delay and then change wood light generators and hazards to dark orbs. So a powerful double orb changer that does not consume hearts and a one turn delay, reasonably strong overall. It's only eight turns, it's not too bad. In terms of their leader skill, it's restricted to only machine types and it's just quite restrictive. It's not really going to work out, so to speak. It's just, you have to match two dark combos, you have to be machine types, a lot of hurdles to overcome. But the main appeal is going to be their very typical but powerful awakenings in terms of like what's kind of considered a good end game sub. Basically, it's got the triple seven, it's got the VDP, it's got the follow up attack, it also has time extent. It's kind of like a Zila, except with a less powerful active skill but again it's a faster charging active skill and it can definitely function well in various teams unfortunately unlike halloween cotton the super awakening is vdp so in co-op you do lose that vdp aspect or three player mode which is still in existence but the idea is you're a very powerful sub that can fill a damage role on a wide variety of teams and it's not to say that it's bad, it's just he's kind of, it just feels kind of like a generic sub. And also at the same time, follow-up attack is less important to have on dark teams, mostly because Ina is quite popular. Whereas on for Zila, especially Wood Zila, we don't have a Wood follow-up attack leader. So it does have a bit more applications. In terms of their other evolved form, they change around themselves around a bit. For their active skill, it just gives one combo count for two turns. I'm oh, sorry, for one turn, increase combo count by two, and then creates five of every orb over any orb. Not the best active skill unless you're playing a rainbow-based team, and that's what they are. They have four times health for attacker types, and then a gazillion attack multiplier matching color crosses. So that's pretty cool. Like, that's a lot of damage. You can activate on basically every given floor, I feel. But you are going to be vulnerable to a wide range of problematic mechanics. You're a rainbow color cross leader. You will have issues with, you need to have a solution for voids because it's going to be difficult to make crosses and VDP. You are going to need to find a way to squeeze and follow up attacks alongside of it, just messier overall. You need to use attacker types. There's a lot of mechanics you have to overcome, but I feel like that it requires a large amount of effort and the reward is not surpassing any current options available. So it does exist, can be strong, but I feel like it's just not as accessible or as easy to play compared to other options. With that being said, if you're looking to use them as a sub, they have natural tape resist and double seven combo with VDP. So reasonably strong offensive awakenings, but I would have definitely preferred to have triple seven combo at least because for at least my opinion, Cards with damage awakening should have more damage awakenings and then let cards without damage awakenings have all the utility. So it is just a fine nitpick, but again, it could make a an issue based on the types of teams you are running. And now we come to the weapon assist. And the weapon assist is actually tremendously powerful. So firstly, it is the only weapon assist to have a cloud and any two of the 20% resists. The only other option would be Romeo's with one poison. This is two blinds. That's already quite a big upgrade and it's cloud and double blind, which are very important. But the leader skill itself is also tremendously, not leader, the active skill is tremendously powerful. It is a leader swap active and is the fastest charging leader swap active. And it's the only leader swap active that has a weapon assist because it's always inherited. So it's the only one that provides awakenings and in this case, beneficial awakenings. So even if you did not need to use the active skill whatsoever, this is a great weapon assist. It's got an 18 turn cooldown, which is long enough that it should not accidentally charge up. And it provides quite a few best beneficial awakenings. At the same time, if you are playing something of leader swap, it's basically a dream come true. Now, generally speaking, leader swapping is most popular for something like Saline for abusing Arena 5 and just 
farming massive amounts of rank experience. But with new leaders, options like Zerog Core, who are orb hungry, who do like 7x6, who also have a one turn active skill, this leader swap can definitely be a valuable option for changing yourself into double Zerog on a bigger board. So I feel like this is definitely going to remain the best leader swap option for a very prolonged period of time. So that in itself is valuable, especially if these types of strategies appeal to you. Next is Chidori. And Chidori in her base form is unfortunately not quite... Well, sorry. It's strong, but the problem is their evolve form is much stronger and they're so similar. Basically, the idea is you have four TPAs, which is nice, but again, TPAs really want to play on TPA-oriented teams. You could use double base Chidori's as leaders, but their evolve form is stronger, and I just mostly want to talk about that because it does lose out a bit on your effective health, but again, you have 2.2 buff times health and 43.5% damage reduction. That is more than enough effective health to really survive anything in the game, assuming you are full health, and that is a big deal. And the point of the matter is you lose that a bit, but you gain you gain more RCV, you gain more attack, and you gain much better awakenings. So you also gain bonus orb movement time as well as bonus combo count. So basically, imagine Yusuke, the original Yusuke, and how it was light water. Now... This is like the Yusuke version 2.0, which is all the things that Yusuke was good at, but better to suit fit in today's meta. So their active skill does increase your combo count by two, and it's the full board unlock and then change to water light. A bit more expensive, but a much stronger effect tied to it. But for their leader skill, you do have actually a lower attack multiplier, but you have the damage reduction and bonus movement time of three, so six seconds, so you have more than enough you have also plus two combo count when matching water light which is what you have to do all the time so that normally that makes it so her 10 combo awakening actually can take effect which is normally not the case on six by five boards but because you get plus two combos this should be happening on a much more regular basis and you also have a team health and team rcv with dual leaders so you have another extra layer of durability furthermore their super awakenings give you full poison immunity. They also can get a uh, TPA or time extend. And remember, if you're using leaders, you only need one of these full poison immunities. So 100% poison just taken care of by one card is tremendously powerful, along with the leader skill dealing large amounts of damage because you can stack 777 combo cards, you can stack orb enhances. And when you form that VDP, you are going to be hitting for incredibly high amounts of damage with both of your leaders, which makes piercing through void spawns that much easier. And the leader skill, like if you look at each individual component, it's not tremendously powerful, but when you add them all together, it creates something that is very powerful. Now, with that being said, the major drawbacks would be lower attack multiplier, so you're more reliant on passive damage. It might be harder to team build potentially. Another drawback is that their active skill is a long cooldown that does not make hearts, and we don't have a water follow-up attack leader, so we can't. We have to deal with resolve. So her active skill may not necessarily help you out in those regards. So you just have to keep those limiting factors in the back of your mind. But she is a tremendously powerful leader. In terms of her weapon assist, it is another skill boost weapon with an attack while above eighty percent. So again, we're looking for skill boost with benefits. So giving 1.5 times damage to the owning card is a sizable damage increase when you are at 80% or more health. So on things like Zeus verse teams, amazing. You're always gonna be full health anyways, so you're giving your damaging card more damage with that skill boost. On Fag and Ride teams, you can give it to your leader itself, and then you can have 24 times personal damage, which is just comically high. With that being said, the active skill attached to this weapon, you have to be aware of, it may not necessarily be that helpful. It's a 300 times attack water nuke to a single enemy, which is good for farming purposes, and a three turn delay. But on Fag and Rai teams, it may not necessarily be the active skill you want to have pop up, so be aware of who you actually inherited on top of. And now we come to the six star cards. So the six star cards all have one evolution, 
and that does limit their overall versatility, but they still have interesting kits. So the first is the orb skin character, Amelia, and she is basically an enhanced healing orb stick. She is going to solve your healing issues for any of your high health, low recovery teams. So that is definitely very powerful, but the main drawback is Tifa tends to dominate light-based teams at this point in time, and the thing is with Tifa, you don't even have to own her. You need to have like a good light leader, you pair with Tifa. It just gives you that option of flexibility. I know it may be set, people think that's boring, but it is efficient, and that does mean that high RC, like high healing solution subs like this tend to have a lower amount of viability, just because it's redundant on Tifa teams. Of course, if the meta changes or you just dislike using Tifa, this will become a much stronger card to use because she can solve basically all of your healing issues because they have very high RCV along with three enhanced heal orbs and they can gain a cloud resist awakening. So it is quite powerful overall, but again, it just has lower applications at this exact point in time and they will be also harder to roll because they are an orb skin character. Next is Grey Words, and they are primarily a burst option for wood and dark teams. It's five times attack for wood and dark, and makes a column of wood a column of dark. Tremendously high amount of burst damage with some orb generation. Definitely helpful for various farming teams that need to have orbs as well as that burst, and they want to make sure they use as few actives as possible. At the same time, they can potentially be a strong damage sub under the right conditions so they could have four tpas or four well they have three tpas and three attack while above 80 percent and with super awakenings they get another one and that does provide them with a 17.1 times personal damage when you make that tpa of course if you can't use super awakenings as a co-op then obviously you just take away a bit of that damage but the point is it's high amounts of damage when you match a tpa so depending on the types of teams you are using to play through content quickly if you're swiping a full board, TPA not so good. If you're individually matching combos, TPA is better. Just some options there, but unfortunately there is no weapon assist option, which can be a little bit of a drawback because if you are wanting to use his active skill, you would like some awakenings. Next is Magic Lin. So, Magic Lin is quite magical. And the reason for that is they generate exactly 15 light and 15 dark orbs, which means you have a 10-10 board with no secondary animation. So that basically screams, I love ranking dungeons because it's a full board changer that guarantees 10 combos, which should be easy to solve with no animation. And that's basically the main conditions to make this active skill good. You wanna solve it fast and you wanna have that consistency and little animation. It's a ranking dungeon solution. It won't be mandatory to crown, I'm going to say, but it will just give you a little bit of an extra edge over your other competing players. Furthermore, if you are lacking a light supportive sub that has strong VDP damage, it can be a possible sub option. But again, light is saturated. You don't get natural bind immunity unless you get the super awakening. And that means you have lower damage output. Like It's still an okay sub, but I feel like it's mostly going to be a ranking dungeon solution. Next is Vulcan and Dorktin, and their main appeal is going to be the fact that they have double co-op boost. And that basically means they have 2.25 times stats when played in multiplayer, which amusingly enough means they provide massive amounts of health through their base health and their regular team health awakenings. So if you need tons of health, they could be your answer. At the same time, do we really need that match health? Probably not. Like, it's just something you're good at, but is that a good thing to be good at? Maybe not. And the main appeal of double co-op boost cards is that you want to inflate the attack stat to as high as possible in order to act as a more powerful button base. Unfortunately, their attack is a pitiful, they're less than 1400 at level 110. That's very low. Your button damage is not going to be that high. You're better off served of most other things. Next we come to Melissa Mao and her active skill is a tri-elemental board changer of dark, fire, and hearts along with reduce an orb unlock and the ability to reduce unable to match orb effects by five turns. So this is a relatively niche mechanic. It doesn't occur that often but 
for those who have played at least in three player arena two and you encounter the evolved form of Gaia who prevents matching of fire, wood, or water orbs for three turns, that will cancel that out, which can be helpful and it does have applications in Alt Arena 3 as well, but again, it is still reasonably niche. That being said, it doesn't actually add many turns to the cooldown, so it's still a 10 turn cooldown for a tri elemental board with unlock. Still good. But the other main appeal for them is going to be the fact that they can gain three balance killers or three machine killer awakenings. No, oh, sorry, two machine killer awakenings. So they have tremendously high amounts of damage against machine and balance types, but again, these are relatively niche typings. Like, they are also balance types, so they can use any killer latent, so they do have more advantages, but again, how valuable is this gonna be comes down to how important it is to you to kill these types of spawns. And that will definitely range from player to player because it is definitely more niche typings overall. And she doesn't have a weapon assist, which could have been useful because that would have been a nice active skill to inherit onto things like Rao or Ina teams because they like those colors and clearing those unable to match orb effects can be meaningful. Next is this individual here. And they have four skill boosts and the ability to give you nine, nine turns of plus one second orb movement time and delays enemies for one turn. That much, like generally speaking, like it's cool. You can give lots of, you can give a little bit of movement time forever, but is that really necessary? I'm gonna say the answer is usually not. Usually right now, time extend buffers are just short. They tend to provide more time extend, but they have a faster cooldown, but they're tied to a more powerful other effect. This case here, the primary effect is the 99 turn Skyfall buff, no, 99 turn buff for time extend. That's not that important because generally speaking, one more second orb movement time is not really gonna help you that much. It doesn't, it's not charging up fast enough to overwrite debuffs quickly, and it's just not really where we want it to be. So it doesn't really fulfill much of a purpose and it has a reasonably long cooldown. And their awakenings do provide wood orb enhance, but they just provide time extend and four skill boosts. It's not providing that much at this point in time and I don't feel it's that amazing. And then the final card in this whole event is Beast Priests Zelos. And for their active skill is their main appeal because for one turn, they only allow fire, water, wood, and dark orbs to fall down. So no light, no hearts, and then change the board to those four original colors that I listed. So what purpose does that serve? Well, the main purpose this serves is that it's for ranking dungeons, for basically cheesing or padding your score as much as possible because of a bloated skyfall count. And the reason for that is because when only four colors can fall down, it's a 25% chance for any given orb, much higher chance for Skyfalls to come falling down. And the fact that the board is changed to those four colors beforehand, again, facilitates that as well. But at the same time, how important is that to you? It really comes down to how important ranking dungeons are to you. Of course, they won't be mandatory to crown, but again, it gives you another extra edge. With that being said, they also have two Dragon Killers and VDP, so they could be a possible solution for Dragon-type spawns for certain kinds of content. Again, I really feel it's mostly a ranking dungeon solution. So, for myself, do I plan to roll? So, I do actually plan on rolling in the Fujimi Fantasia collab because it does have quite a bit of value across the machine. Yes, it is more top heavy, but I still wanna get some of those five, um, six star cards. They do provide value. And for my dream rolls, Lena Inverse is the default winner for eight star. There's no other choice. Congratulations. They're still spectacular. For the seven stars, I had more of a conundrum, so to speak. And that is because I basically kind of wanted uh, Gabrieve, Sagra and Orphan, and I wanted them for different reasons, but the thing is, for the light card, I don't really need more powerful light subs. It would definitely be an improvement, but the amount of improvement I'm going to be gaining is relatively small. It will be stronger than my other options, but it's not, it is just a bit stronger. I don't need it. I can clear everything I need through my Tifa Helm routine for Alternate 3, and I'm okay with that. On the other hand, Sagro would give me the fastest charging leader swap active in the game, but at the same time gives me cloud and double blind, which is something that does not occur naturally with a long cooldown. So it is actually a valuable inherit in my opinion to have 
But again, I kind of went with Orphan as my choice because I did choose Zerog Core and it does have the most synergies with each other. It will make both of them perform significantly better and I feel like that would be the most desirable seven star card for myself. And then finally for six stars, Magic Lin I want because I want that perfect 15, 15, 10 combo board for fast ranking dungeon solves. I feel like that'll be the five star, that six star that'll benefit me the most. So in conclusion, this collab is quite a strong event. It does have much more top heavy favoritism, so to speak. But with that being said, the six star cards are still quite powerful. So it is definitely worth rolling a few fair number of times because it is a debut event. It means they are, the cards are being released at the height of their power, so to speak, because they're new. So they should be kind of keeping abreast of power creep, along with the fact that they have unique kits. And at least for the first couple of rolls, you shouldn't be getting too many dupes. With that being said, let me know what you think about this event in the comments below and how much you plan on rolling. Hopefully you all have a fantastic day. I wish you all the best luck in your own pad adventures and happy puzzling.